There was no better place to interview the Swedish guitar legend Ingve Malmsteen than in the lobby of the most opulent hotel in the center of the medieval town of Bologna, Italy. And you know, what can you say about this guy apart from the fact that he lives by the mantra, more is more? And you're going to see why. Speeding, Ingve Malmsteen, take two. Were you attracted to classical music because of the virtuosity and the challenging aspect but of it? Was that the heart what, of it? What it was, was that I felt like, you know, I needed to be more, yeah, like you said, challenged, you know. Because I was a freak. I was a little freak running around, you know. I mean, I, it was, I, I look back at it now and I go like, what the hell was I thinking, you know? You know, because... It was, it isn't you were like, a freak because you were obsessed with music, or, or well, yeah. I mean, because because it, it's not like now where it's like you know it's some sort of like a um, you know made into a video game and everybody knows if you become a, like a rock star, you know you get rich and you get laid and all that stuff. There was no talk about that. It was just the music that freaked me. Like, like, I went nutty about it, you know. I felt like I had to be better than I am, you know. And to me, to be better would be to play more difficult, more, instead of two string, it would be three string, four string, five, six string arpeggios, and uh, on the 64th notes, and, and, you know, and really challenge myself. And could, how, could I actually make this into a four, four octave arpeggio, for instance, you know? How do I do that? Where do I start with chromatics and stuff like this? So to me, it was a matter of not boring myself. I never wanted to be a classical musician, but I loved the classical tonalities and the, the more complex and, and it's not that much complex. It's just that it's a full scale. It's an eight note scale rather than a six or five, you know. But you brought the classical sound quite boldly into the rock and metal format than what anyone else had. And but may I say, a little bit as, as an accident, which is really ironic as well, because I came to the States just because I, I knew I couldn't make it in Sweden, you know. And I tried a lot, and I was 18 years old, and I got invited to come to the States to record an album, which was a pretty banal record, really. You know, in this, it was very simple, Steeler. But I figured, you know, I can do this, and you know, I get to go and do something, so I did it. And I got offered to do some things, UFO and things like this, and I, I decided to form a group with Graham Bonnet, because he had no songs, he had no direction. So I got in there and I put my, sound on that record, which I felt good about. And we went to Japan, and we were like the Beatles. It was unbelievable. I mean, I've been in America for a year, now I'm in Japan, it's like I'm playing fest Osaka Festival Hall, where they recorded me in Japan. I remember doing the sound check, and I was going, oh my God, this sounds, this, oh, you know, I couldn't believe it. And so they offered me a solo deal, but they said, it mustn't be any vocals on it. And I said, but I, I don't want to do an instrumental record. I don't want to make it, but it, it turned out it became mostly instrumental record, and that has since become sort of a blueprint of instrumental rock guitar, you know, which, which was a little bit of a weird part, because it, just because it was instrumental, I had to put more classical thing on it, less riffy, more guitar, like lead yeah, stuff yeah. on it. You mentioned Paganini. Why is Paganini important to you as well? Very good question again. Um, I was on a quest when I was a kid. I didn't know what I wanted to do because it wasn't someone who's doing what I felt I should go to, you know? And um, I formed kind of a sound that I liked, you know, where that I could make the guitar almost sing, you know? Um, combination of Strats and Marshalls and stuff, which I, you know, I haven't changed <laughs> that. Um, but it, it was only so much you could do, like, and I'd, I'd, I'd listen to flute and stuff like this. And once again, I saw on TV, it was, uh, I was 12, 13 maybe, it was this guy, Russian violinist, who was just going mad on the violin, you know. I couldn't believe it. And I took like a, uh, like a, like a boombox, I put it in front of TV and I recorded it, you know. And they said at the end of the program, it was Nicola Paganini's 24 Caprices. Plus apparently Paganini you know, channel the devil, or at least that's what people said. At oh, the time. It's, it was a lot of, um, to, like, uh, you know, he sold his soul to the devil to uh, achieve these abilities, you know, which is so funny because they, a lot of people draw the parallel with me and all that stuff. One time I was 
I was at home and somebody called my phone, and this is a couple of years ago. I said, hello? Who is it? Oh, Steve, Steve. Steve who? Steve I. I go, hey, how you doing? And I go, no, it's not Steve. I'm not Steve. This is not Steve. Don't call me, I said, don't call me. Oh, uh, uh, please, let me just ask you a question. Yeah, okay. Did you sell your soul to the devil? And I'm like, yeah, I did. See ya. <laughs> you know? You know, somebody got hold of the number for some reason. So it's, uh, it's still a... Uh, a silly thing. Can you, sorry, can you then you go a little bit further with your idea of less is more and more is more? Like, could punk rock it's very better? simple. It's very simple. You know, it's very simple. I remember when I was first starting recording, the first solo album, no, the first Steeler album was produced by Mike Warney, but it wasn't really, it was just more or less him sitting there going, yeah, great, great. And then the second one I did was Alcatraz had a producer in there. And he kept on telling me to slow down, you know, I said, hey, slow down. I'm like, oh, oh. You know, remember, less is more, less is more, he said. And I always said, how can that be? How can less be more? It's impossible. More is more. You know, simple, simple logic. And uh, so that, it became a little bit of a joke and, uh, you know, motto. So. so I like the most marshals and the fastest notes and stuff, fastest, co whatever. I, li I like it because it's fun. And, um, you know, why do it halfway, you know? I just can't see why less is more. It's impossible for me to relate. <laughs> What's your legacy so far, in your opinion? It's a big question, but what, what do you feel in the big picture is what you've brought to, to music? I can tell you this much, that I went to America with one guitar and one extra pair of pants and a toothbrush. Mm -hmm with uh, no direct plan, you know? And the fact that I'm sitting here now, 27 years later, talking to you, is mind boggling. Which means that people still give us, you know, a hoot about what I'm doing. To me, that is the reward, you know? That it's not only been great all of, like really great, but it's been great for a long, long time, you know. And I never really expected that, you know. I never thought that that would happen. And so I take, take that as a great gift, you know. What do you think it is that you did specifically musically that allowed you to be here 27 years? The only thing I can think of is the fact that I've always been stubborn and extremely dedicated to what I do. And I really believe in what I do. Mm -hmm. And to quote Nicola Paganini, one must feel strongly to make others feel strongly. It's a gamble, but I think that's what work makes it work. Because if you just follow the wind, you blow away one day, you know. And I've always kind of like taken the good with the bad and, you know, criticism I'm used to, you know. So I just, as long as I believe in what I'm doing, I think that's the right thing to do. I think that's why I'm still here. Cool. Thanks, Yngwie. Thank that was you. great. Pleasure. Thank you, Thank you so much.